Good morning. On the second last day of winter in Melbourne, according to the calendar, Tuesday all over the world is the 1st of September, so for us that should signal the first day of spring. Those of you who live in Melbourne will, like us, be loving the blossoming trees and bushes and shrubs. It's just a wonderful time. It will be even more wonderful when we have got our COVID outbreak, second wave, whatever you call it, under control, and everyone feels more free. But we are free to go out and to enjoy the beauty of spring. Uh, I was just reflecting this morning, the eastern suburbs of Melbourne on the whole have not been nearly as badly impacted as, by the virus as other parts of Melbourne. I see on the whole there have been pockets. But this week we were the part of Melbourne most affected by a really strong storm, nothing like the ones in the US, but still strong by our standards, went through and three um, people actually lost their lives, including a four-year-old boy. And this morning we found out that he lives just around the corner from some of our church members. And yes, tragedy we've been made aware can strike in many ways and a reminder to savour every day and to always care for those in our circle of life. So on that note, it's just after 11 and I will hand over to Graham. Thank you, Christine. Welcome everyone to Blackburn Presbyterian Church. It's great to have you with us this morning. Thank you for joining. This is our 24th Sunday of streaming. Um, and uh, in Melbourne, we're in stage four lockdown, which includes a curfew and uh, restrictions on how far we may move far from our homes, five kilometers, and the number of times we may leave the house. It's uh, only two weeks of this to go, hopefully, but it seems to be having the desired effect. Please uh, take time to look around the church's website and uh, if you would like to leave a comment, we'd appreciate uh, knowing, hearing from you on the Facebook page, if that's where you're viewing. This morning we have um, uh, all the usuals, I guess. Well, not quite, but uh, Amanda is going to play viola for us, and uh, that's a piece which I think you'll enjoy listening to, and hopefully that, that will settle us as we come to our worship. Uh, I'll be doing the Bible reading, Christine will be doing Young at Heart, and the sermon series on great texts of the Bible will continue as we look at the burning bush. These, uh, the information about this is in the leaflet, which you can download from the web page if you would like to, and you can follow an outline of the service there. But in the meantime, let's begin with prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the privilege of drawing near to you. This is our response because in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have come near to us and you want us to be in a relationship with you. You want us to be your children and his friends. And we pray today that you will speak to us and remind us of this great privilege and this status that you've given us and help us to aspire by the strength of your spirit to live each day as your people. So unite us to serve you and do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, here's Amanda to play Largo and Allegro uh, from a Sonata in G Major by Telemann.
So here I am again. Um, this week, hopefully I think I said earlier, the second last week of stage four lockdown, our lives have actually been enhanced unexpectedly by two new and very enjoyable activities. Uh, together, these two activities, which I'll explain in a moment, made me think of the verse in Psalm 8, verse 8, in the Scottish metrical version, which both Graham and I were brought up on. Birds of the air, fish of the sea, all that pass through the same, how excellent in all the earth, Lord, our Lord, is thy name. Now, I'm not really going to talk about fish, although I'm going to talk briefly about something at sea, but I'm going to focus on birds. Okay, the first activity which I recommend to everyone who is young at heart, but especially perhaps to those of you who have young people in your lives, is the Penguin Parade at Phillip Island. I think it will be open to people all over the world, but I'm never quite sure how these things work. But if you just type in Phillip Island Penguin Parade live streaming, you'll get it. It's streamed for about half an hour, I think, every night on dusk. Now, dusk in Melbourne at the moment is just after 6 p.m., so just after 9 a.m. in the UK. And sorry, I can't tell you the time for other parts of the world, or I think Germany is just after 10 when we have seen this penguin parade, which we absolutely love, we've usually been sitting outside, rugged up because of the onshore wind. And of course now, here we are watching it in our heated homes. It's a beautiful event. I think you see part, part of Thursday nights um, on, in the photograph there. Um, so we watched it on Thursday and dipped in again a little bit last night. Thursday, it was very high tide and very, very stormy seas. In fact, I realize now we were walking, we were watching just around the time this storm was causing most damage out this way. Normally, we've watched penguins waddle across the beach, but on Thursday, the combination of high tide and high seas was just washing them straight onto shore, actually straight onto the rocks, but they were fine. They didn't get hurt. They just then gradually waddled off. Last night they were much slower to go up to their burrows. Um, there was another bird around that the commentators didn't think would frighten them, but the commentator was feeling that there was something there that was scaring them. Anyway, we didn't watch the whole thing. The other treat which we enjoy on and off through each day is this peregrine falcon's nest. I think you can see the falcon there. And at that point, the nest actually was empty. This nest is just above 367 Collins Street. Now, Collins Street is one of our main cities in the CBD. There you see the bird, one of the birds, we can't tell which one, sitting on the edge and there's one egg in the nest. We first saw peregrine falcons in 2017, in May. We were visiting our daughter and her husband and children in London, actually going to spend time with the children over the Easter holidays. And on our first Saturday, we were in Regent's Park with our grandchildren and their dad. And there was then a telescope that we could look through to see the peregrines. But now we don't need to squint through a telescope. We can actually thank to the web webcam or cams, look straight into the nest. And hopefully those of you who are from Melbourne will recognize the view down on the bottom left. That's looking down onto the river. 
with that bridge that cr I think it's a footbridge that crosses the Yarra there. Now, gradually as we've watched, there's been a second egg laid. A lot of the experts are chatting. There's a chat line down the side. Here you can see one of the birds, probably the mother, sitting on the two eggs. But the experts tell us that the eggs, there's more eggs to come. In fact, yesterday a lot of people, including me occasionally, but a lot of us were watching because she kept seeming to give the signal that she was about to lay a third egg, but she didn't. We clocked in this morning, but the bird was cover, totally covering the eggs, so we don't know whether the third egg was laid or not. But here you see the bird and the two eggs underneath, so not actually um, sitting right on them, which apparently the experts tell us the, the mother hen does not, the mother bird does not sit on the eggs. There's an expression for that which I've forgotten until all eggs are laid. Now we took this cut from another photo because I was surprised to see how beautiful the actual eggshells are. Anyway, that's our second um, distraction of the week and anyone around Melbourne, I'm sure, can again just go into three Collins, 367 collinsfalcons.net.au, I think it is. Now, I've always enjoyed watching birds, whether the lorikeets that sometimes cheer us on our walks in lockdown, they were actually more visible in the first lockdown. I think they may have gone to warmer climes, I don't know. Saw two last week. Or the crimson rosellas, which all Victorians will know from Wilson's Prom. Or the birds of prey demonstrations at Taronga Zoo and at Hillsville Sanctuary. I also think, just as being such sources of pleasure to observe, that birds have a lot to teach us. Jesus explicitly, explicitly referred to birds in his teaching in the Sermon on the Mount, which, as I, you, most of you know, Graham's been preaching on through both, of both lockdowns, I think, so far. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, Jesus says, Look at the birds. They do not sow seeds, gather a harvest and put it in barns. Yet your Father in heaven takes care of them. Aren't you worth much more than birds? And later in Matthew chapter 10, verse 29, For only a penny you can buy two sparrows. Yet not one sparrow falls to the ground without your Father's consent. As for you, even the hairs of your head have all been counted so do not be afraid. Probably an important message for us at this time. So do not be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So let's keep enjoying the wonders of God's creatures and remembering and reminding ourselves how much we matter to him, how much he cares about us, how much he cares for us. May he bless us all. Thank you, Christine. It has been fascinating watching the Falcons, I must say. And the Penguin Parade was quite fantastic. I received a text message from a friend who said that his children are eating their vegetables as they uh, ravenously as they watch the Penguin Parade at tea time. And... Uh, no trouble with getting them to eat their vegetables, apparently, as they watch the little penguins come scampering ashore. Well, it uh, looks like I'm the Bible reader this morning, and the Bible uh, passage is from Exodus chapter 3 and the first 15 verses. One day, while Moses was taking care of the sheep and goats of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, he led the flock across the desert and came to Sinai, the holy mountain. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame coming from the middle of a bush. 
Moses saw that the bush was on fire, but that it was not burning up. This is strange, he thought. Why isn't the bush burning up? I will go closer and see. When the Lord saw Moses was coming closer, he called to him from the middle of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. He answered, yes, here I am. God said, do not come any closer. Take off your sandals because you are standing on holy ground. I am the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So Moses covered his face because he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have seen how cruelly my people are being treated in Egypt. I have heard them cry out to be rescued from their slave drivers. I know all about their sufferings. And so I have come down to rescue them from the Egyptians, to bring them out of Egypt into a spacious land, one which is rich and fertile, and in which the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites now live. I have indeed heard the cry of my people, and I see how the Egyptians are oppressing them. And now I am sending you to the king of Egypt, so that you can lead my people out of his country. But Moses said to the Lord, I am nobody. How can I go to the king and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? God answered, I will be with you. And when you bring the people out of Egypt, you will worship me on this mountain. That will be the proof that I have sent you. But Moses replied, When I go to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors sent me to you, they will ask me, what is his name? So what can I tell them? God said, I am who I am. This is what you must say to them. The one who is called I am has sent me to you. Amen. May God bless this passage from his holy word to us this morning. Now today we're looking uh, in our series of great texts of the Bible at this passage. Uh, it's been significant for Presbyterians for centuries. Um, this image that I've chosen to use this morning is taken from the uh, tapestry uh, pulpit drop in Scotch College. Uh, and it was especially uh, prepared for the 150th anniversary of the school uh, some years back. So I'm using this as our image, and the, the burning bush is our theme, and the old Presbyterian logo for Victorian Presbyterian Church and Presbyterian churches in all parts of the world used to contain these Latin words. We, we don't like to throw Latin in front of people nowadays, but I remember growing up with these words, nec tamen consume batur, and it means simply burning, but not consumed. So... What we're looking at today is the commissioning of Moses, whose name appears hundreds of times in the Bible and 85 times in the New Testament alone, frequently on the lips of Jesus. Christine's already alluded to something where Jesus said about birds, but he also spoke about Moses in the Sermon on the Mount and in other places. So in this incident, we're going to look at Exodus 3 and we're going to discover something about Moses, about the call to Moses, and there are four things that I want to bring before you this morning, and I hope that we'll all feel uh, the significance of them. The first thing is that the Lord is the holy God, Yahweh. I'll explain more why I've used these four letters in a minute. The second thing is that Yahweh is the personal God. We need to think about that as well. Then the call itself to Moses, and then finally the role that Moses is called to. So let's begin with this, the holy God. The angel, the word angel means messenger, the messenger of the Lord who appeared earlier in the stories of the patriarchs in Genesis, uh, now appears to Moses. And as he appears both as the messenger of the Lord and sometimes as the, the one who has all the prerogatives of the Lord, as the Lord himself, uh, the text says this is both strange and compelling. The four-letter Hebrew word 
uh, you can see it here. Uh, he, bear in mind that Hebrew writes from Hebrew writing is from the right hand side of the page to the left hand side of the page. So the little letter is at the beginning is the first letter of this word. It's the letter Y or Yod, uh, not a jot nor a tittle. That's the letter when Jesus said, not a jot nor a tittle will be taken from the Lord. He's referring to the tiniest Hebrew letter, the Yod, and he's saying that the, the whole uh, stands. So here is the four letters, and these letters are consonants. The name is these four consonants. But c compare with here the, with the verb to be, the I am. And you can see that the yod has changed to another Hebrew letter, the letter vow. And so there's just the tiniest difference between the name of God and the verb to be, I am. So there are no vowels in these four letters. So the, the pronunciation of the word is unknown. For centuries it was unknown. And eventually, uh, between the 6th and the 10th century, uh, Jewish scholars put in the vowels from the, another name, the name Adonai, to, to give it a, a, the ability to be pronounced. And many years ago, I took uh, boys to see the Dead Sea Scrolls when they came to Melbourne. And it was obvious there, and we pointed out to them, how the, the divine name in the Hebrew text was written in a different script entirely so that a scribe reading it wouldn't actually try saying the divine name. He would come to this name which was written in a different script and would pass over it. And so the, uh, the uh, English Bibles translate this word as the Lord in capital letters. And it's a different meaning from the word Lord in lowercase letters. Or they translate it as Jehovah. The authorized version uses the word Jehovah six or seven times as a translation of this word. Or they use the word Yahweh. If you want to go over this, every English Bible has in the introduction a paragraph explaining the translation of this particular uh, name. Uh, it's, I'm calling, I prefer to call it Yahweh. Uh, which seems to be as close as we can get to the original. But Yahweh is the holy God, and he comes to Moses. And if you want to read about the translation, these four letters, uh, commonly called in, in uh, studies the tetragrammaton, the four letters. How do you translate these four letters? The answer is it's a challenge, but it has to do with God's self-reference. Nicky Gumbel says, this name declares the unique greatness and eternal nature of our God. The name in contracted form becomes the name by which God is known throughout the rest of the Old Testament. In Hebrew, Yahweh, normally translated into English as the Lord. Moses' subsequent obedience to God, he says, was rooted in his understanding of who God is. So here is God revealing himself to Moses by reference to this name, I am who I am. It's strange and mysterious, and despite attempts to explain the visual phenomenon associated with the burning bush, uh, in natural terms, there is no satisfactory explanation. The encounter is an epiphany which transcends otherwise rational explanation. The messenger tells Moses to come no closer and to remove his sandals, for the Lord is holy. The word means separate, separate. God is distinct from us. The Lord God is holy and separate from us. The encounter presents Moses with a transcendent God, but at the same time, the transcendent God has come to him. And that's the second point I want to bring to you, that Yahweh is the personal God. Now the significance of a name in Hebrew is vastly more than a label. We think of a name and we think so a word we like to use with respect say to our children or we think of a nickname to describe a person. Uh, uh, and so we, we may give names that have some reference to a person's character but in Hebrew it was normal for names to relate to character. And the name of God signifies his presence in the fullness of his revealed character. And in this short passage alone, we notice 
that he has seen things, he has heard things, he knows things, and he remembers things. Now these are all anthropomorphic terms. These are things that we do as human beings. We, we see, we hear, we remember, we know. And by using these terms, uh, God is inviting Moses into a relationship. God calls him by his name, Moses. If you read chapter 2 of Exodus, and I know some of you have been reading it recently, if you read chapter 2, you'll see that Moses was drawn out of the water. He's the one who was drawn out by God, by, by the Pharaoh's daughter to start with, and was given to his mother to be cared for. I'm hoping you all know those stories. Uh, but there in chapter 2, we have the, uh, the naming of Moses. I will call him Moses. And here is Yahweh saying, Moses, using his name. He knows him. So Moses is totally known to God. And this is, in effect, God's invitation to Moses to know God, the God of his ancestors. The God who entered into a covenant with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, who are all mentioned here. This God who sees the oppression that has come to the Hebrews who are now slaves in Egypt. The experience of the people there is described as miserable and the injustice perpetrated is, uh, in God's words, as it were, described as cruel. The story of the Hebrews in Egypt is totally known to Yahweh. Somehow, he feels their pain. The Lord remembers his covenant. It has not been forgotten. And his mercy and steadfast love, two terms which always connected with the covenant throughout the Hebrew scriptures and come in again uh, later in the book of Exodus in a big way. This remembering uh, has to do with his visit to, to Moses. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. So God has come to him personally. God is personal. Holy and personal. But what does this mean for Moses? Well, it's a call to action. But it's action that Moses doesn't want to take. God is going to set the prisoners free. He's come to reveal his purpose, to rescue people and set them at liberty. This is the great theme of the book. It's called the Exodus, the way out. It's so well known. The story is so well known. And Moses' name has come to be synonymous with the forming of the, 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 uh, the families of, uh, of Abraham, the family of his descendants, into a nation. With, with the giving of the law, given through Moses, as uh, John reminds us in uh, John chapter 1. The nations called to be God's holy people. His tabernacle was to be at the center of their camp. The way out included the Passover ceremony and sacrifice. To achieve his purpose in the world, the Lord, Yahweh, is about to send Moses to Pharaoh with the demand to free his people so that they may worship him. But Moses doesn't want to do it. Jesus knew all about this story. He said that he hadn't come to abolish the law of Moses. He came to fulfill it. That's exactly what he said. And we saw that when we looked at the Sermon on the Mount earlier in the year. Jesus was transfigured on a mountaintop. Another of those um, experiences which we cannot rationally explain. Where Moses and Elijah appear with him and then disappear leaving him alone. And the voice says, this is my Beloved son, listen to him. So Jesus was transfigured there and in heeding the call of God on his life, Jesus became the Passover sacrifice. What Moses did in history, Jesus was the reality that that symbolized. The Passover lamb symbolized in the annual meal which Moses instituted on the eve of the Exodus was what Jesus came to be. Today the message of Yahweh comes to us through the one whom the law and the prophets bear witness, Jesus, one at the same time, the messenger of Yahweh, but also claiming the prerogatives of Yahweh. In the New Testament, Jesus identifies himself as, 
as the Lord in a number of different ways. It's a whole area of exploration, but I just want to mention two things quickly. Firstly, in John's Gospel, you'll find Jesus, it's striking to John that Jesus repeatedly calls himself, I am the good shepherd, I am the bread of life, I am the light of the world. So Jesus uses this, this, time, this claim repeatedly. And uh, so John, in the light of that, says at the very beginning, as we saw in the first of these great texts, Reflections, uh, he was in the beginning with God and was God, the Word. So John clearly gives Jesus this ascription that he, in fact, is, is the Lord. And, of course, as Israel's shepherd who carries the name Yahweh in, in several places in the Old Testament, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. We could explore that theme, but we won't know. But the important thing for us today is that he knows your name. The hairs on your head are numbered. As Christine was saying, if he cares for the birds of the air, how much more does he care for you? You're invited to believe that. His call comes to you not from a burning bush, but from a cross. At the cross, where the love of God was finally and fully made known. How much does he love you? This much. Arms open wide. He invites you to come to him and to find your freedom in him, your liberty in him. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I wonder, have you heard him call your name? The call is to each one of us unique as we are, to be uniquely his people, revealing his love and his mercy in the wider community. That's the Christian call. Have you resisted the idea, perhaps, that God might know you and have a call on your life? What role has the Lord Jesus for you in his service? Well, let's look firstly and finally, and firstly with respect to the idea of the call, what role it might be at what it meant for Moses. God's purpose to Moses included cooperation and activity. Moses had to say yes, he would. Uh, but Moses' involvement in God's purpose was crucial. He had the background to access the Pharaoh, the language skills, the ability to rate, relate to both the Egyptians and to the Hebrews alike. But Moses didn't want to be involved. He lists numerous reasons why he's a poor choice. Beginning with, as you heard at the end of the reading, I'm nobody. Who am I to do this? Take time to read on beyond where I finished at verse 15 and see the string of excuses that Moses gave. I don't have all the answers. People won't believe me. I'm not qualified. I'm not a good speaker. Who will I say sent me? A whole string of reasons. And eventually God says, all right, Aaron can go with you and be the spokesperson, but and so Moses capitulated and went. Well, today, Jesus calls us to follow him. If we want to be free as God's children, what decisions might that force upon us? What might we have to change? What risks do you feel that that might involve? And what are we afraid of losing if we make this commitment? When C.S. Lewis turned from atheism to belief in God, he felt he had no option. He felt hemmed in. Perhaps that's how Moses felt. Lewis described himself as the most reluctant convert in all England. Today, more than 50 years after his death, his books and writings are still in print and have a worldwide readership. He became possibly the greatest apologist for the Christian faith in the 20th century. Like Moses, we might prefer that God's message had not come to us. Were we not comfortable like we were? Why should we be tasked with easing misery and ending cruelty? Well, when you think about it, peacemakers are too easily caught in the crossfire. But that's one of the roles Jesus calls his, his people to. But then again, think of this. What did Jesus give up? to redeem us and set us free? What risk did he run and what price did he pay? 
Read Philippians chapter 2. It's beautifully set forward in an ancient hymn there. What role is God asking you to play that you might help achieve his purposes? Moses was to emerge as the great leader of Israel. He brought the law. He established the tabernacle, the marker of God's presence in the Israelite camp. He established the priesthood. He established the sacrificial system with the annual day of atonement. It's all there in the book of Exodus. And all of these things were fulfilled in Jesus. Jesus is the presence of God with us. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He is the sacrifice. He is our Passover lamb, says the Apostle Paul. And so we come to God in Jesus, who brings the whole of the Old Testament scriptures together, especially the Mosaic legislation, but the prophets as well. It, it, it all climaxes with Jesus. In all of this, to achieve these things, Jesus bore our shame and our pain. And he now bids you to come to him. He knows you and he has something for you to do. And it will liberate you. It will set you free. May we all enjoy the, the glorious liberty of God's children. May that be part of our experience this week. Let us join together in prayer. In our prayers today, I have a number of things which relate to what's happened through the week. And uh, I've, I've scripted it and it will appear on the screen. We do not presume to come into your presence, Lord, trusting in our own goodness, but in your all-embracing love and mercy. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table, but it is your nature always to have mercy. Please feed our faith with the total commitment of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Saviour, that we may forever live in him and he in us. We read of your call to Moses and thank you for the pivotal role you gave him among your people of old. But we thank you most especially that grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Help each one of us to hear your call to faith in him and to service to others. Right here in Victoria, we're grateful that the numbers of people affected by COVID-19 is significantly reducing. We remember the elderly who are infected and are again grateful that the plight of the disabled has been brought to public attention. We pray for all health workers and ask that those infected may regain health and strength. We thank you for their service and the work of all who care for people who have contracted the virus. We ask comfort for all who have recently suffered bereavement. We are grieved by the loss of health and productive work and difficulties this has created for young and old, for the employee and, the, and employers alike. Please help our federal and state governments to work together until the pandemic is passed and to minimize the financial impact. Lord Jesus, you are the great healer. We bring before you all whose mental health is adversely impacted by the virus, and especially during lockdown. We are also concerned about the increasing number of people turning to gambling, alcohol, and other drugs. Help us to rebuild friendly relationships in our communities and enjoy the local recreation areas while we may. Prince of Peace, we bring before you the scourge of domestic violence, which the police advise has worsened during lockdowns. We pray that perpetrators and their victims will seek and find the help they need before it is too late. We hear of catastrophic weather events with trees burning or blown over, storm surges, hurricanes, coastal erosion, electricity down and contaminated water, just to mention a few from this week. Thank you for the work of first responders with, the, with their urgent, urgently needed emergency skills. Use them to ease suffering and bring hope. We pray for comfort for the afflicted, especially the Melbourne families who have lost loved ones. Lord, we know that the bulk of human suffering is caused by our inhumanity to one another. 
especially our common recourse to violence. Lord, forgive us and heal us. As we bow before you, we would ask for the Spirit of Jesus to help us resist evil and pursue what is right in your sight. We have so much information about nations and people, about the powerful and the weak, about the privileged and the exploited. As we have followed events in overseas, we are concerned for threats to democracy in many places, most recently in Mali, Belarus, and Russia. We are sad that another church in Turkey is being converted to a mosque and that in Ethiopia so many Christians have been massacred recently. We pray with lovers of justice all over the world that Martin Luther King's dream, shared over 57 years ago, may be realized and that justice might flow like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. These things we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, who taught us to say together, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Just some words of benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift upon you the light of his countenance and give you peace. Amen. God bless you.